all of you that are clapping. I mean those of you clapping for Jesus Christ. I mean you are clapping for the King of Kings, the Lord of Lords, the Lion of Judah, the Holy One of Israel, the Okayome, the Weber, Jebel, Lauren, Yadu, it shall be well with you. Today, you will rest from every struggle in the name of Jesus. God bless you. Please be seated. It's a wonderful day, isn't it? A day we have been waiting for. We have been announcing and announcing and announcing. But today, like Job says, that I have been hearing with the hearing of my ears, but now I can see. You see anything? Can you see anything? Can you see something? Oh. Now, you know, regularly, you know, people come in here from America, they come from Europe, they come from London, you know, to bless us in this place. We're very special people, isn't it? And I always tell you there are four different ways by which you can encounter Jesus Christ. But today, I want to tell you the two ways by which God can send your divine helper. Praise the name of the Lord. You yourself can walk into a divine helper. Like the woman, 12 years of issue of blood, with her leg, she just walked into it. But your divine helper can just waka, waka, enter where you did. You understand? No stressing, no fretting. You understand what I'm saying? Like the widow of Zarephath, hopeless and helpless, ready to eat the last meal and to die. And suddenly, God instructed a divine helper. Say, go meet this woman. Today, a miracle don't begin. I believe that there's someone for whom God is sending this divine helper this morning. If you're that one, lift up your hand and shout hallelujah. <laughs> Without much ado, we have a father in the house, a father in the Lord. The PICR, the pastor in charge of the region. Praise the name of the Lord. Region 19. It's our privilege to host him in the house today because God has sent him for a specific person. Me being the first person. And maybe my wife and then maybe somebody else. Praise the name of the Lord. And he has come with a message for someone. And I believe that that message will be delivered to you. And at the end, you will enter rest from every struggle in the name of Jesus Christ. You don't introduce a father to his children. How be it? I will still just, because it's just formal, to introduce a father in the region, a man who is so passionate about family. One of the reasons, the two testimonies that you have heard, about the family thing that he's, you know, about, you know, um, talking about. He's so passionate about it. He wants families to be united, family to have peace, you know, and to be orderly. And you have had two testimonies. And it's going to be happening every quarter for the men. So if you miss the last one, the next one we will announce to you, I think it should be around April or so, so that you can, you can attend. But the man we're talking about is... A, a lawyer of no small repute, the highest that you can attain in the legal profession is a senior advocate of Nigeria. Praise the name of the Lord. And is the husband of one wife, by the grace of God. I'm very sure about I know that very clearly. Praise the Lord. And um, so in the house this morning, welcome with me, our Father in the Lord, our Father in the region. Pastor Femi Atoyebi, S E N. You're welcome, sir. You're welcome, sir. Thank you, sir. Good morning, everyone. Good morning, everyone. But I'm going to do me a favor before we get into God's word. I'm going to turn to someone and wish that person say, Happy Valentine's Day. 
Tell him or her, I love you with the love of God. Tell someone, I love you with the love of God. How many, how many of you know? How many of you know that a lot of people have never heard anyone tell them that they love them? And the church must be ready to provide that kind of love and shoulders to cry upon. So one more time, tell someone else, I love you with the love of God. You may take your seat. God bless you. I would like to extend my deep appreciation to our senior pastors in the house this morning. Pastor and Pastor Mrs. Austin Ukiwe and Auntie Debo, as I fondly call her. Thank you so much for the great job that you're doing here. God bless your heart. God continue to strengthen your hands in the name of Jesus. Pastor Tunde Agara, thanks so much for that prayer session. God used to speak to me this morning. And Pastor and Pastor Mrs. Stone, you look at me. God bless you, our PIC, APICPs for this province. Pastor Oshin, where is he? God bless you, our host pastor. God bless you. Amen. Pastor Lisa, we're so happy to have you back. God bless you. God bless you. And, and of course, I salute all of the men and women of God who, who are lifting up the hands of pastor on the altar. May the Lord strengthen and uphold you in the name of Jesus. As I always said, wherever I went, it was sufficient if someone just came to meet me. When service has started, I'd rather you stay in God's presence and continue to pray for me because I need that more than coming to meet me. I appreciate that, but I'd rather that just one or two people will come and will just remain on the altar. I'm sorry if I said that publicly, but because I need to let people get the right message, I'm not anywhere near as important as God. So we'll stay in God's presence and let man be man. Amen. Hallelujah. Jeremiah chapter number one. I am so delighted to be back here. It's my first time since the region was created uh, nearly two years ago. But I really bless God for what he's doing in this assembly. God bless you all richly in the name of Jesus. Jeremiah chapter number one. Pastor, God used you to speak to both, both Pastor Stunde and yourself. I, I was, please sit on, sir. I was rolling in my spirit two or three messages. I wasn't sure which one God would have me preach. But both of you, you made a statement which you will soon see was all God used to tell me exactly what he will have me say this morning. And may you never hear my voice. May you hear the voice of God. In the name of Jesus. Jeremiah, we're going to read three portions of scripture. One each. One verse from each book. And I'm going to ask you to please remain on your feet with me. As we honor God by reading his word standing. May I invite everyone. Because I like your production here. It's very crisp. Very good. I really like, I really love it. So I don't have to struggle. I don't have to, I don't have to shout. <laughs> Hallelujah. <laughs> Jeremiah chapter number one is the first reading. I love to worship before I, pre- before I preach, but somehow I'm under constraint of time. Verse number five, Jeremiah 1, 5. Before I formed thee in the belly, I knew thee. Before thou came came as forth out of the womb, I sanctified thee, and I ordained thee a prophet unto nations. Jeremiah 29 and verse number 11. They're all very popular scriptures that we're all used to. Jeremiah 29 verse 11. For I know the thoughts that I think towards you, say the Lord, thoughts of peace and not of evil, to give you an expected end. And finally, Job chapter number 14. Job 14 and verse number 5. Saying that his days are determined, the number of his months are with thee, thou hast appointed his bounds that he cannot pass. Father, 
thank you for the entrance of your word that giveth light and bringeth understanding to the simple. Thank you because your word have we hidden our heart so that we may not sin unto you or against you. Wherewithal well, shall a young man cleanse his ways, O God, except by taking heed according to your word? Lord, we pant for your word this morning as the deer panted after the brooks of water. And we are asked for the few moments that we have to spend in your word. That you will show us illumination. You give us a listening ear. An open mind and a receptive spirit. In the name of Jesus. Lord, we, we desire to have a rest. Oh God. Whatever it is we need to do, oh God, to get the kind of rest that only you can give, please do it in our lives in the name of Jesus. Amen. See the Holy Spirit of God, you are my senior partner in the ministry. You are my teacher. You are my enabler and you are my strength. And I ask in the name of Jesus that this hour you come and help me. Come and help all of us here this morning Amen. in the name of Jesus. Thank you, Heavenly Father. Have your way in this place and glorify your name alone. In Jesus' name we pray and the church of God said amen. Amen. The Lord bless you. Take your seat. Hallelujah. By God's special grace, I'm the convener of Men Arising Conference, which God has laid upon my heart to be speaking to men, to husbands and fathers. That's what I want to devote the rest of my life Onto. That's how serious it is to me. I've seen a lot of warning by the enemy against the church, the body of Christ, trying to destroy homes just because we don't have knowledge of the things that God will have us do. So God has called me to be speaking extensively to men and fathers. And as Pastor rightly pointed out, we'll be having this for now on a quarterly basis. The next meeting will come also come up in Acme in April. And then another one in July, Jesus stories, and as our souls leave, please encourage your husbands to attend. They certainly will turn out to be better husbands and better fathers. I thank God for those two testimonies. Uh, we spoke about fatherhood over that weekend. We're going to be speaking about the relationship between the man and his wife. And it's true, you could be 60 years old in your marriage, and you don't have a clue, really, about what God will have you know from the Christian viewpoint. Uh, please try to attend if you can. And I'm trusting God, the pastors will tell you the details as time goes on. This morning, I'm going to be sharing the word with us on help us of destiny. Say to me, say help us of destiny. Pastor, I hope you can see how God uses to speak to me. Help us of destiny. Say it one more time. Did you realize from the three text messages that we read from scripture, some profound things that God has pre-planned for you and I. The first one we read was Jeremiah chapter 1 verse number 5 and this is what God says. He says, before I formed thee, God says, I knew thee. Before you came forth out of the womb, he preordained why he's creating you and what he's sending you to do on earth. Are you here? So, if you are on the earth, God said before your parents came together, he knew you. He planned you. And I have good news for someone this morning. Because as I go around the world ministering the word of God, I've had a lot of people come to me, some of them aching in their hearts, because the parents have told them, that they were a mistake because we stopped, we decided we're not going to have children anymore but he came eight years after our last child. Uh, how many of you have heard something like that before? Good. You are not a mistake because that scripture says before I formed thee, I knew thee. Hallelujah. Not only did he know you, he already ordained what you would do. For Jeremiah the prophet, he says, I have sanctified him a prophet unto nations. That's number one. Number two thing you need to know, the second scripture which we read 
in Jeremiah 29 verse 11, he says, I know, again God speaking, I know the thoughts that I think towards you. Thoughts of peace and not of evil to give you or to bring you to an expected end. So God says, not only did I know before you were formed, not only did I ordain you to come, I also have a plan for you. So tap your neighbor and say, your ne- say neighbor, you are not an accident. God is a master planner. Believe me. He is a master planner. He plans you. And he says, the plan I have for you is not just any haphazard plan. It's a good plan. A plan to give you, as the NIV says in Jeremiah 29, 11, a future and a hope. So God has created you for a wonderful, wonderful plan. Hallelujah. Now, Job 14.11 says, God already appointed the day you are going to return to him. Now, that's very interesting. Each time a Christian passes on, especially if he does so at an age that you and I thought was premature, we ask God questions. But the day he was living, the day you were being sent to the world, Job 14.5 says, you had already signed a contract when you are going to return and you could not cross that bound. No, you didn't hear what I said last. So let's marry those scriptures together as we go on this morning. So God foreknew you before you were conceived. He ordained you to come and do certain assignments on the face of the earth. But he also predetermined the day you will return to him. That is what I call a destination. Can you say to your neighbor, destination? Destination is the end of the journey. It's from where the word destiny was taken. Everybody say destination. Say destiny. So that is something that has been pre-planned for you by God. Now the major problem that most people have is that Many of us don't know the plans of God for our lives. Neither do we know how to accomplish it. So, but because it was God's plan, not your plan, not my plan, are you still here? Because it's God's plan, only him can help you to accomplish it. I repeat myself. Because it was the plans of God that you are here to accomplish on the face of the earth, only he can help us to accomplish it. So what, what God does is that he then sends help for you and for me to take you from one level or stage of your life to another stage of your life. The whole idea being that you will walk in his plans until you reach your destination. If God does not help you first, you could never identify what the plan for your life is. Even if you did, if it didn't help you, you can never accomplish it. Can can I hear you say an amen? Amen. Now, even though God is the one who is going to help you and I, he will always use men. You need to help me now, encourage me. I love people encouraging me by responding. I said God will help somebody here. In Psalm 60 verse 11, Psalm 60 verse 11, the Bible says, Give us help from trouble, O God, for vain is the help of man. Psalm 108 verse number 12, Psalm 108 verse number 12, is that give us help from trouble, O God, for vain is the help of man. God is going to use a man or men or whoever he chooses to use, but believe me, the helper is God and men are just the extension of his hands. Now you've got to understand that, and I'll explain to you why in a minute. In Psalm 17 verse 14, Psalm 17 verse 14, the A part, the Bible says, for men who are thy hands, O God. In other words, men are the hands of God. If you don't understand that whatever help you get in life that promotes you from one place to another is from God, you would tend to give the glory to the man. you got to understand that God just planted that man, that woman, in strategic position for you 
to take you from point A to point B of your life. They are not the helper for no man can help you except God sends him. It's important for you to realize that because when man does something for you and you don't understand that he's from God, then you tend to give him the glory. Isaiah chapter 40 verse number 8. The Bible says, I'm the Lord that God that brought thee from the land of Egypt. He said, my glory will I not share with another. Neither will I give my praise to golden or carved image. God does not want to share his glory with anyone. So get to know that whoever it is that God is sending to you as the help of your destiny, he is just an instrument in the hands of God and he is not the helper. Are there wives in the house whose husbands are, God is using to do some great things? Thank God for your husband. But it's God who has planted him in your life to help you do that. So when you are praying, tell Lord, I need a kind of the name of Jesus. Don't close one to God and open one to your husband. Because it may please God to do it through him today and tomorrow may choose whoever he wants to use to bless you. Can I hear you say an amen? amen? And husband, don't you ever think that you are a helper. You are just an instrument in the hands of who? Because if you don't do it, God will still do it anyway. I say God will still do it anyway. So, now you and I were created as children. Let us imagine this is the start of our journey at this point. And we're going to a destination where we have the keyboard, the first keyboard. In between here and the keyboard is our journey in life. One, we don't know where we're going. We don't know the way to it, but we don't even have the strength to get there. So what God does as a child, he begins to raise helpers of destiny. I must say help us of destiny. Say it one more time. In most homes in Africa, actually anywhere in the world, depends on what you call them, we have house helps when you just have a baby. Is that correct? Is that correct? Or sometimes grandma. Auntie Debo, you've been doing that. Praise God. So when the baby is born, you find people come to help the mother, especially if the mother was having the first child. She's never done it before. Please talk to me. Good. And so, those guys are helpers of destinies. The grandma or the house help, as the case may be. Maybe the nurses, maybe the doctors, they have a part to play in the life of that child. From, from being a child to the crawling stage to the walking stage to the schooling stage, are you still in the house? Now, do you realize that grandma cannot stay with you forever? So, when the child comes of certain age, or when she thinks that your wife or her daughter's case may be strong enough, she moves back to her own house. Does that make sense? The house help, let us, let us assume you have a, a male child. You have a female house help, usually female. Is that correct? Okay, so she bathes for him. She takes him, walks him to school if he's nearby the house and so on and so forth. But it comes to a point that the boy gets to 13, 14, 15, 16, 17. Can the same house help be bathing him? So, watch this. Help us of destinies. Let me define the word helper. A helper is someone who God has placed in your life To help you do what God has asked you to do or provide assistance to you to make your doing it easier. Good. So, but the first thing you need to understand about helpers of destiny is that they fall into three categories. I'm trying to preach a three-week message in 50 minutes. So, I'm going to rush through it. You've got to be a bit faster as you come along with me. So, God provides the house help. When he becomes, when the child comes of school age, he goes to school, nursery school. Is that correct? You have an auntie in the school. And he comes back, everything, thank you so much. I feel, 2 Corinthians 3, 17. Now, the Lord is that spirit, and where the spirit of the Lord is, 
Hallelujah. God bless you, sir. So he goes to school. He comes home. The song he's singing is whatever song auntie taught her or him. Is that everything you say, auntie said. Auntie said. Okay, he's forgetting the house help and the auntie has become the next help of destiny. And then he moves from that to a primary school. He's beginning to learn some serious business now. And then to, to university or to secondary school, to universities and so on and so forth. Is it possible for the guy when he gets to university to insist that the auntie who taught her in nursery school should continue to teach her? Why? Excuse me? Because I didn't hear the answer. I hear a lot of answers, but the simple reason is that one helper of destiny has taken him from point A to point B. He has finished his assignment and he cannot continue being a helper because if he does, he's no longer going to be a helper. Oh my God. It's going to become a burden. So let's talk here. Because of time, I'm going to deal with three types of helpers of destiny. And you will be able to identify each of them in your life. You are going to see where you made mistakes, where you have lost your, your place of rest, where you can make amends. Believe me, you're going to begin to enjoy peace like a river. In the name of Jesus. So number one thing you need to know about helpers of destiny is that some of them are for a season. Some helpers of destinies are for a season. Number two, some of them are for specific purpose. Just specific purpose. Number three, some of them will appear to you as enemies. That's very interesting. And number four, if I have time, some of them are permanent helpers of destinies. Now, so let's go very quickly. Number one, you've got to understand that each time God sends you an, a helper of your destiny, he is meant to take you from point A to point B. You are going to probably point G or whatever it is you're going. But that particular helper is not supposed to go beyond point B. If you don't understand that, you're going to lose your rest in life. You're going to lose your peace in life. So I gave you the example of the child. I mean, I, I, I used to, when God has blessed us with three wonderful children, 25, 22, 20. And I remember when they were growing up, I, I always helped my wife to bathe them when she was doing some other things. I have one boy and two girls. But at 22, even at 19, can I bet for the girls today? Not even for the boy. You know why? God used me as a helper of destiny along with the house help and the mom to bring them up to a certain point. But the greatest problem we have in the church, the body of Christ at large, is this as Christians. We don't seem to know what kind of role God has sent some helpers to play in our lives. Even when we do, we hold on to them for longer than God has ordained. The problem is that they always, any help of destiny that spends a day longer than God ordained will be a problem to you, not a helper. So let me speak to you because of those, let me, don't let me come too far there because of those who may not see me. So Genesis chapter number 12, verses 1 to 5. Genesis 12, verses 1 to 5. Listen to what happened here. The Bible says, now God has sent it to Abraham. Get thee out of your country and from your kindred and from your father's house. Oh my God. So let's stop and break it down in a second. So God said to Abraham to get out of his, to get out from three people or three things. Can you help me? Number one, talk to me loudly. Country number two, who's a kindred? Okay, number three, good. And then he says, to a land that I will show thee. And then verse 2 says, and I will make of thee a great nation, and I will bless thee, and I will make thy name great, and I will bless him that blesses thee, and curse him that curses thee, 
And in thee shall all the families of the earth be blessed. So let's stop reading in verse 3 for a second. So here God says, get out of your country. Leave your kindred. Leave your family. Because I want to show you something. I want to do something in your life. Now those of us who know Abraham. Abraham was what? What was he doing before? At this point in time. He was a farmer. He was a rich farmer. Genesis chapter 13 verse number 2. The Bible says now Abraham was very rich in cattle, in sheep, in silver, and in gold. So he was very rich. He was a rich farmer. So God said, move out. I'm going to tell you why God asked him to move out. God said, I'm going to show you something bigger, something better. But you must go out alone, only with your wife. Are you still here? So verse number 4 of Genesis 12, the Bible says... And Abraham took his wife Sarah and Lot with him. Okay, now stop reading for a second. Did he take Lot? Did he take Lot? Who was Lot? Sorry? Okay, some people said cousin, no, his nephew. Okay, so verse 5 actually says he took Lot, his brother's son. So that is nephew. Why do, don't you ask questions when you read scriptures? Verses 4 and 5 repeated it that he left as God has spoken to him but he took Lot two times. So let me ask you a question. Has he obeyed God? He has but not in totality. He left. But he didn't leave with all the things or people that God said you should leave behind. Now ask yourself a question. Why will he take Lot? Let me break it down for you quickly. Lot was a young man who was walking and helping him out in the farm. Are you here? Do you agree? Those are facts. So, if you like, in today's language, Lot was the general manager of his farm. At his age, at the age we're talking about, he would be so old. He was 75 years old. Because Genesis 12 verse 4 says he was 75 years old when he left Iran. At 75 years of age, how much of farming can you do? So he thought to himself, God said to leave my country, I have no problem with that. He says to leave my kindred and my family. If I left those behind, who will help me farm? I can't do that. I have to take Lord. God has to understand. Are you still here? The reason he took Lot was because he thought that without Lot he couldn't go further in life. And to God, Lot had become a God unto Abraham. Abraham was no longer looking to watch God but unto Abraham. Unto Lot. I apologize. Unto, unto Lot. And he thought Lot was someone he couldn't do without. Tap your neighbor and say, the only person you cannot do without is God. Psalm 124, verse number 8, the last verse. He said, the God is our helper. God is our helper. Oh, God is our helper, not a man. Because Abraham's focus has shifted from God to Lot, it was the major reason God said, leave everybody behind. And see what I, God, can do in your life. He wasn't going to trust God. So it took Lot. Guess what happened next? God went quiet on him. Don't forget that Genesis 12:1, the Bible says, get out of your, your, your father's house, sorry, the country, the kingdom of father's house, unto a land that I will show thee. But God went quiet. He couldn't hear him anymore because he hadn't obeyed God. Can I chip this in to say that when God speaks to you and you haven't done the totality of what he says and you are asking him to speak to you more, he does not do so. God isn't prodigal with his word. You must do what he says first before he says something else to you. Because God loves Abraham. Abraham. It was then Abraham, not Abraham yet. Then God caused what I call a strife between him and Lot. Turn into Genesis chapter number 13 and verses 7 and 8 up to 9 actually. 
Genesis 13, 7, 8, 9. Are you there? Now the Bible said, now there was a strife between Lot and Abram, between Abraham's headmen and Lot's headmen. Verse number 8, Abraham went to Lot and said, Young man, let there be no strife between me and you, neither between your headmen and your headmen. Is not the whole land before you? He says, I pray thee, separate from me. For if you took to the left, I will go to the right. If you decide to go to the right, I will go to the left. But please go. Now that was what God gave him in the first instance, wasn't it? He said, don't take lot. But let's, let's go on. Why would God say that? Anytime God finds that you are too dependent on someone and he has become or she has become a God in your life, God will need to separate you. Not your wife, of course. Because some of you can say, ah, pastor said I'm too dependent on you, I can go. That's not what God meant. As a matter of fact, just in case I don't have a time to get there, the permanent helper that you have in your life is your spouse. I don't know if I get there, but there are two permanent helpers you have in your life. The first is the Holy Ghost. Number two is your spouse. So whatever I say is subject to that. Let me just clear that. So that some people don't take undue advantage of that. Hallelujah. But watch this. How many of you have seen a space shuttle take off from the earth? I need you guys to do me a favor and let me see if you have seen one. Space shuttle. Okay, you guys don't watch TV. I promise you it's not a sin. But jokes upon how, how many of you have seen the space shot to take out? Okay, yeah, quite, quite, virtually everybody. If I, I want to see if you're observant, it's very important to what we're saying. When a space shot is about to take off, because of the weight and because of the height it's supposed to be going. It is propelled by two objects, one on either side. Have you seen that before? Good. Those two things were the things that helps it and gives it thrust to move up. Now, if you are also observant, once you get to a certain height that you can see, what happens to those two things? They get detached and separate. It's the same word the scriptures use in Genesis 13 verse 9. I pray thee, separate from me. Now, let me ask you a question. Why did you think those two objects on the right on the left that gives you thrust, why does he have to drop it? I'm afraid I can't hear anyone. Okay, let somebody stand up and talk to me. Yes, they have finished the assignment. That's one good reason. Number two, the weight. Can anybody can anybody clap for this pastor? This man, this man. I want to prophesy you become a pastor. If that thing, if those two things don't get detached and separated from that thing, rather than it going up, the weight will be pulling it down. It is what happens when God sends someone to your life, and He has finished. His assignment. But you will not let him or her go. He will continue to drag you downwards. Now it does not matter. It could even be your sibling. It could be your blood relation. The truth is that there comes a time in life when you have to draw a line. And stop being emotional. When you get, when you continue to be emotional, you can only be dragged down, not up. God has sent him or her, and we must be grateful to God for their lives, for the period God sent them to your life to do whatever they have to do. Once they've finished, let them go. I'm you saying, Pastor, don't talk to my cousins. My, no, 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 I'm not saying that. There are certain things you will not be able to do with them no more. You've got to understand that they have finished the assignment in your life. And God is already preparing someone waiting at that point B to take you to point C. Now when you hold on to the man who is coming from point A, you don't let him go. 
what you do is you are blindfolded from seeing the help in point B to see. But more importantly, you are also dissuading the guy who has taken you to point B from detaching from you and going to help someone God has prepared him for. Say, help us of destiny. Say it one more time. That was the problem that Abraham had. Lord had, Lord had helped him. He had become a rich man in the business that he was doing. Lot was the general manager. Thank God for his life. God said, enough is enough. Some of you, you are holding pity parties. It's the reason you lost your peace and your rest. Your pity party is someone walked out of your life. And you don't even know that God caused the strife because he loves you. Some of our young people have relationships that God has no hand in. You're not married yet. You're dating someone you shouldn't be dating. And just because God loves you, he caused a strife between you and that man or that woman. And he or she walks out of your life and then you are going mental because God is trying to help you to the next stage. Stop crying over spilled milk. God said that man probably has done whatever he needs to do. God has used him to stabilize you at a point in time when you were emotionally unstable. But you are not supposed to marry him or her. <laughs> Learn very quickly before you destroy your life further. That was the saving grace for Abraham. Abraham learned very, very quickly. <laughs> so come with me to Genesis 22 from verse number 1. Is the Lord talking to one or two people? Yes. Say, may his name be praised. Yes. Genesis 22 from verse number 1. Now the Lord, uh, now the Lord did tempt Abra, Abraham. And I wish I can teach you about that, but I can't because Genesis 12 and 13 was Abraham. But Genesis, from Genesis chapter 17, verse 5, you come to Abraham. I can't teach you about that this morning because of time. Now, God did tempt. Genesis 22, 1, Abraham and, said unto, Abraham and said unto him, Take now thy son, thine only son whom thou lovest, and take him to one of the mountains in Moriah, which I will tell thee of, and there sacrifice him unto me a burnt offering. Oh my God. I wish I could talk about that. I don't have time as well. And then the Bible said, on this number, verse number Three, and the Bible says the next day Abraham took his son and two young men. Oh my God. Oh my God. Is that your Bible? Everybody say two young men. Everybody say Abraham has learned his lessons. Can I talk to you? Again, God said, take thy son. Thy only son, whom thou lovest, and take him to Moriah, and there offer him a bronze sacrifice unto me. Okay, have you digested that verse? God said, go and slaughter your child. Don't just, your son, your only son, don't, don't just slaughter him. Set him on fire and burn him to ashes. It's not one with these scriptures. It's so easy to just gloss over it. Those were the instructions of God. And God did not just say your son. He said, thy only son. God didn't want him to go with there with anybody, sir, except the son, and I'll tell you why in a minute. <coughs> Excuse me. So he grabbed his son, Isaac. He grabbed two young men. It was not coincidental. It was not just to fill the pages of the Bible that the Bible describes the men as young. Are you still here? Because when you do sacrifice in those days, you have to carry the wood, the knife, quite a heavy load. So, Abraham at that point will be minimum 112 years by my own estimation. You can't find that in the Bible. I'm just estimating. Why? Because Isaac, Isaac is now old enough to do a three-day journey walking. So, I imagine it will be 12 minimum. Even if you call him 10, it doesn't matter. Because when you add that to 100, because he had Isaac at 100, that means that that man is about 110 years old, minimum. So, 
How can he carry the wood, the knife, all the things they need? So he needed young men, abled young men, bodied young men who carry those stuff. Are you still in church? So he took those guys to come with me. As they were going, Isaac smelled a rat. Isaac said, Dad, he said, your son. I think that's in verse 5 or 6. Well, you know in verse number 4, the Bible said on the third day. Everybody say on the third day. Say it one more time. The Bible says he looked up and he saw the place from afar. So I'm coming back to that in a minute. So as they were going in verse number 5, I believe Isaac said, Dad, uh, I've watched you do sacrifice. Not once, not twice. Every time you did a sacrifice, there was always an animal. Where is the animal? The man, of, the man said to him, he said, the Lord, I think that's verse 7 or 8, he said, he said the Lord himself, the Lord will provide a lamb for himself. But watch this. The first thing he see, when he saw the place afar off, the next statement that Abraham made, Abraham was that, young man, thank you so very much. I can see the place I'm going. It's no longer far. I can get there. I don't need you no more. Can you stay here? And I and the lad will go yonder and worship the Lord and we will both come back to you. So the man asked the two young men to stop following him. Do you know why? He learned his lessons from Genesis 12 that when God sent you on an errand, the helper he gives you is the one you should take. The one he didn't give you, don't go far with them. How many of you can imagine what would happen if those two young men had gone yonder with them and they got to the place and he bound Isaac as he was to do later and he took the knife to slay Isaac. What would those two young men do? Now you are getting the story. Now who will overpower who? The young men. That was why the Bible calls them young. For the glory of the young man is his strength and that of the old man is the gray hair. He knew that if you took them along, they would say, Papa, you must be nuts. You waited a hundred years to have a son. You have what you want? No, we will not allow you. Can I say this to you? There are some people in your life. They cannot handle the things that God is asking you to do. You don't have to walk with them. So he dropped them. But watch that. It was after that when Isaac, you know when they set out on the journey, the first, second, third day, Isaac was confident. Because he knew the father loved him. Because God said, whom you love. So he imagined that if there was no animal, one of these young men must be the sacrifice. But when the two of them dropped, uh, he looked at the man and he said, <laughs> I can see everything but the animal. I hope you are not thinking. That it's going to be me. I wish I can teach on this. How many of you know that Isaac is a type of form and shadow of Jesus? As a matter of fact, as Isaac died on the, the, the Moriah, so also Jesus died. And I read the commentary, and I believe it, a Bible commentary that said, the same mountain where, G, where Isaac was crucified or was, was, was slaughtered by his father, literally slaughtered, was where Jesus died on the cross. He tied his legs. How many of you know that at 12, even at 10 years old, a 110 year old man cannot tie a young man if he didn't want to be tied? So it was pure submission, pure obedience unto the point of death. As Philippians chapter 2 verses 9 to 11 said concerning Jesus. But let's go on because that's not the point this morning. So we see that Abraham has, Abraham has quickly learned his lessons. He put those guys beyond, behind and he went yonder. I can tell you when it appears that there's no help coming. There is a help where God is leading you. For in Genesis chapter number 22, in verses 9 and 10, Genesis chapter 22, verses 9 and 10, the Bible says he laid Isaac on the wood, he tied him, 
took the knife to slay him. And then the Bible says, And the voice of the Lord came calling the second time from heaven, saying, Abraham, Abraham, lay not your child, lay not your hand upon that child, seeing that thou lovest and thou lovest me. He says, since that you have not withheld this from me. But watch this what happened. And Abraham looked back and saw a ram that was caught in a thicket by its horns, and he took it and offered him a sacrifice unto the Lord. And he called the place, verse 13, I believe, Jehovah Jireh, for in the mount of the Lord it shall be seen. What does Jehovah Jireh mean? Jehovah Jireh simply means the Lord who saw your provision, who saw your needs before they arose and made provision. If you don't know, let me break it, let me break it down for you. I'm sorry I'm rushing because you don't have all the time. You know the point? Because he went to the place where God told him to go. It was the place, not any place. Because that ram couldn't have grown overnight. Are you in church? God planted him there. Every time God asks you to bring money to do something, believe me, he is wait, he's already made provision. He is just looking for a legal reason to bless you. Because if Abraham didn't go, the ram was waiting. Tell your neighbor, don't keep your offering in your, in your pocket. Give it for God when he needs it. John chapter 6, verses 11 and 12. The Bible says, for Jesus knew in his heart what he will do. So learn to let people go out of your life. Pastor, can I speak to you, sirs, all the men of God in the house? You know, sometimes we lose members. Members just go. For one reason or the other, no good reason or good reason. It doesn't matter. They just leave your church. Pastor, listen, you've seen it before, sir. I know sometimes if the church is just a growing church, or if the person who left is very important, maybe financially, you tend to lose your sleep. It's happened to me before, sir. But see, God always planted people, church members, they could be apostles. I just planted him in Victory Center to do an assignment. When that assignment is over, when he moves on, pastor, don't lose your sleep. There are some people who will live by what is seemingly called an offense. And pastor didn't come to do my name personally. And pastor didn't do this. And they left church. 1 John chapter 2 verse 19. 1 John 2 19. The Bible says, but they went out of us. But they will have stayed with us. But because they were not part of us, therefore they left us. For if they are part of us, they will have remained with us. I'm telling you that some helpers who have finished their job, who are no longer supposed to be part of you, don't hold on to them because they will cause friction in church. Just make sure in your prayer they go to another church. As long as they are not backsliding and going to the mosque. It's fine. Hallelujah. I love my members, but when they go and I try to show love, but if they have to go on to another church, I don't lose my sleep because God must have been saying they finished assignment here, they need them elsewhere. Number two, I, I don't have all the time, so let me rush through. Number two, very quickly. So my purpose of destiny, they are for specific purpose. Specific. You probably haven't known them before. You probably haven't heard of them before. God just raises them from nowhere. They help you and they exit your life. Let me tell you a true life story. A Christian was going to Ilone many, many years ago. Driving and in between, I think, or you and Obama shot somewhere around there, he had a flat tire about 9.30 p.m. on the night. Evidently, typically as it is with many cars, he didn't have jack. Are you still here? And was, oh God, Jesus, you got to do something here. So he came out and didn't know what to do next. He testified. Shortly afterwards, something happened from the thick forest, very thick. One huge man. He said, about nine, probably ten feet. Came out of the bush. He was here. He said, be not afraid. He used one hand, lifted out the whole car. Bring the aspirator. Without using not, he removed the tire that was 
he put the other one there, put this one in, and before he could say Jack, he disappeared where he came. That's an angel of the Lord. Come on, give God praise for that. I'm sure you, you say, but where is that in the Bible? Hebrews 13, 1 and 2. Hebrews 13, 1 and 2. One says, let brotherly love continue. Two, he said, be not weary to be kind to strangers. For some have by so doing entertained angels on a wheel. If you don't believe me, ask Abraham. Genesis 18, in verses 1 and 2. The Bible says he sat in front as he came out of Mamre. In the, in the heat of the day, he sat in front of the tent door. Verse number 2. And behold, he looked up. And he saw three men. And Bible says he ran towards them and beckoned unto them and said, Come in. Please come to my house. Let me wash your feet. Let me give you food. You know the end of that story. As he was doing that, he was doing that to angels of the Lord. After they had eaten and drank whatever he had to provide. Genesis 18 and verse number 9. They said, Where is your wife? <laughs> he could have ignored them. He could have refused to acknowledge them. He could have refused to honor them. But gave them provision. They said it's at the back of the tent door. Verse 10, Genesis 18. They said, according to the time of life, your wife shall conceive and be thee a son. And the Bible said, verse 11, that it has, that, but now Abraham was old and well speaking in years, and it has ceased to be with Sarah after the manner of women. The NIV says of that verse, it said, Sarah had gone into menopause. Check your NIV. So, he couldn't bear children. They said, so when Sarah heard, he laughed. <laughs> Old God, ancient God. He has forgotten all about medical principles. I, started, I stopped menstruating 40 years ago. How can I conceive? And God heard. So why did your wife la- have life? Then she was adding sin to sin. She said, ah, no. No, really. He's calling God a liar again. God said, I'm the Lord God of all flesh. Verse 14, Genesis 18. He said, is there anything that is too hard? But guess what? Those three guys were helpers of their destiny for that specific purpose. But if you hadn't entertained them, you could have lost it. Tap and say, be kind to people on the road. The people you meet on your li- in your life, on the road of your life. You never can tell who they are. You know, it's the same story with Elijah and the woman who was, the woman who was barren. Said, let me, let me make a room in, in, upstairs. Whenever you come this way, just stay there, lock it up, take the key wherever you're going. Be a blessing to the man of God. So one day the man of God called the servant and said, what is it that that woman lacks? He said, ah, he doesn't have a child. Ah, ah. <laughs> As my father and the Lord always prays, the God who called me. Elijah called upon the God who called him. And according to the word of the man of God, she became pregnant and she bore, bore a son. Can I hear somebody say an amen? amen? Tell your neighbor, don't ignore your help of destiny. Because of time, let me do the third and the final one because I've mentioned the first one. Very important. Your, the Holy Ghost and, and your spouse. Number three. This is very, very important. Some of the helpers of destinies will appear in the form of enemies. Write that one down. Some of them will show up as enemies. And naturally, what do you do? How do you respond to your enemies? Help me here. Sorry? You either fight them or you run away from the east, as far as the east is from the west. Is that right? When someone says, I'm, I'm your sworn enemy, you want to avoid him. Please write this one down. Some of your helpers of destinies will come in the form of enemies. How can God send me helpers and they appear to me as enemies? Did you just increase the time? <laughs> because I was watching it. The spirit of the prophet is subject to the prophet. 
Thank you, Pastor. Appreciate that. Sir. Or should we close? Thank you very much, sir. I'll make it brief as I can. How can my help of Justin be an enemy or appear to me like an enemy? How many of you are like me who didn't like mathematics when you were in school? Oh my God. Let me tell you what. I had F8 in maths. Now that's worse than F9. You know, in, those, in my own days, pastor, they only had the uh, manual typewriter. That's the way you write nine. Now, that nine, if you did so badly, it would then go and join the one on top and become F8. That's what I scored in math. Guess what? I hated my math teacher. teacher who insisted I had to do my homework, any subject, whether English, whether math, you know, for us in those, everybody, you just want to play. Those teachers who applied the cane, we saw them as enemies. I am who I am today by the grace of God. But I bless God for those hardline teachers. No, you didn't hear what I said. <laughs> I'm not sure I know of many children who loved their mamas when they were growing up. Because mamas would insist they had to take certain type of food. Are you still in church? Everything that you don't like, your mother will try to get you to do it. But a mother knows that if a child doesn't eat, it's not going to grow healthy. Are you still in church? Believe me, whether you like it or not, when you were growing up, that's how you saw your mother. That's how I saw my mother. That's how you saw your teachers. And everyone who was hard on you was an enemy. Looking back today, how many of you will stand up and give your mother and your father and your teachers a hand of praise for what God you stand to do? You could never come this far. But for those wicked parents and wicked teachers, you call them. That is life. If you allow a child to do what he likes, he would turn out a vagabond. So they impress it upon you whether you like it or not. They can kill you and draw you and just hug you the next minute. But the truth is that you saw them differently. I saw them differently. Come along into scriptures. How many of you know that the greatest friend of the church is Judas Iscariot? Oh my God, you're not listening to me now. Okay, let me put it this way. Let me put it this way. If, Jesus, if Judas Iscariot had not done what he is done, where would you be today? I said, where would you be today? You would have been, you and I would have been the most miserable in the world. He was not an enemy because it was written that he had to betray Jesus. He wasn't the enemy of Jesus. It was an instrument of destiny. <clears throat> because if Jesus was not betrayed, he wouldn't have been crucified. If he wasn't crucified, he wouldn't have resurrected. If he hasn't resurrected, you have no hope. I have no hope. He was a helper of destiny for Christians. But as I close, let me tell you something that's a bit more quite graphic. How many of you know Joseph? The dreamer. How many brothers did he have? Okay. 10, 11, never mind. He has nearly a dozen. Okay, fine. How many of you know that all his brothers were not his enemies? All his brothers were helpers of destiny. How many of you know the, the, the young man that he interpreted dreams for in the prison was not his enemies, even though he forgot him. 
How many of you know that Potiphar's wife was not his enemy? Oh my God. <clears throat> God planted each one of them in those strategic positions to take him. If he passed one test, he goes to the next. If he passes one test, he goes to the next. Everyone who thought was his enemy, they were pushing him every inch nearer his destiny. Your stepmother is not your enemy. She shielded you, or sorry, she bombarded you with everything that hell has to offer. That's what toughened you. That's what made you to come to where you are. She appeared to you like an enemy, but God placed him or her in your life to push you nearer your destiny. If you are alive today, everyone you thought was your enemy helped you to be where you are. Even the brothers of Joseph thought that they were enemies of of Joseph. So come to the last chapter with me of Genesis 50. Genesis 50. Hallelujah. When you clean your, when you understand this, you will clean your heart from every form of unrest. People walk out of my life and I don't lose my sleep. (laughs) You just have to have an understanding of scriptures and walk upon your high places and let nobody trouble you. Hallelujah. Before there will ever be a a Joshua, sir, or before Moses will ever depart, a Joshua will be there. Joshua chapter 1 verses 1 and 2. The Bible says Jesus said, Now Moses, my servant, is dead. Joshua, arise. Before the departure of Moses, God has prepared a Joshua. So if you are walking out of my life, believe me, someone is walking in. So there, there comes this day when God had taken Joseph to the destination he promised him. He had now become the prime minister of Egypt. There had been famine in the land and the food was scarce everywhere in the world. And they came looking for food. And the brothers and, you know, Joseph, oh my God, Joseph sat down there, he recognized his brothers, his brothers did not recognize him. Isn't that what the Bible said? Do you understand that someone who has a dream will always be changed? The brothers couldn't recognize him because they were still what they were. He had changed. So, he started speaking to them in the Egyptian language. They were interpreting, even though he could speak the language. Eventually, when they knew it was the one, Genesis 50, from verse number 16. So, they came. When they realized that it was Joseph, their brother, whom they have sold into slavery, they said, our father said to beg you that you should please forgive us. And they went on and on and it was like they were dead. I love the answer that Joseph gave from verse 19, Genesis 50. He said, am I in the place of God? For whilst 20, you thought it evil. God meant it for good. And he has sent me ahead of you so I can preserve many lives as it is this day. Joseph was able to accomplish his destiny because he didn't see those helpers of destinies. Even though they appeared as one, he never saw them as enemies. Jesus stood on the cross of Calvary. He prayed a prayer when they nailed him to the said, Father, forgive them. Because I am doing what you called me to do and they all are to help to push me to this point. Forgive them. Many of you are struggling in life. You lost your peace because you are living in unforgiveness of those you thought were your enemies. Without whom you can never get to where God has sent you. Come on, give God praise. I was in a deliverance service many years ago and the man of God had called for people to come who needed healing on the queue and they queued one after the other and was praying for them and laying hands on them after the entire service and then that came on the line sir this woman she had a massive stinking 
saw a massive one. I think it was on the right foot. And she came on the line. As the man of God was going to lay hands upon her, God said, don't pray for her. Excuse me. He said, ask her. What has the mother done for her that is so bad? So the man of God said, ma'am, God said I shouldn't pray for you. Do you have a problem with the mom? And she screamed, yes, yes, I can forgive her. She killed my firstborn son. And then she stomped out of the land and ran out of the auditorium. True life story. The devil is a bad devil. She really wanted her to die of that soul. She, ran, she, she rushed out of, this, of the church auditorium because she didn't want to forgive her mother who according to her has killed her first son. Now, some weeks or months, I think, afterwards, the woman traveled all the way to another city where the man of God was. And as he came on the line to be prayed for, the woman of God said, ah, I think I've seen this face before. He said, yes, sir, so, so, please. And the woman who blah, 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 told the story. He said, so why are you coming back? Because I can't pray for you. He said, I'm ready to forgive my mother. So the man of God said, I don't even need to pray for you. Go and be healed. Within two weeks, everything cleared. That is the power of unlimited forgiveness. Many of you are going about it for people to lay hands upon you and you are not, you're, you're not forgiving someone who God even used as a help of destiny. You can't even forgive them. Pastors can pray for you until kingdom come. The word of God will not be true if you are healed. Except you let him or her go. Are you still here this morning? And so if you want to have rest, don't hold grudges against people. Pastor, you have no idea what they did to me. No, I didn't. But I do have an idea of what you did to Jesus. And if he could forgive you, you have no excuse. No excuse whatsoever. And invariably, most of these people are people who have helped you in the past. Who God has used you, you to bring you to where you are today. It does not matter what they did. The Lord's Prayer, when you read it from Matthew chapter 6, 6 to 9, it says, forgive us our trespasses as we forgive. So you are saying that God's forgiveness for you should be made conditional on your ability to forgive. Can I ask you to rise up this morning, everyone, to his or her feet? But you know you are struggling with unforgiveness. Please don't hide it. Come, I want to pray with you. So you can have the rest for your soul. I'm living in unforgiveness. Someone offended me. Please come. I want to pray with you. For, it's going to be a prayer of faith. Very, very quickly. I'm struggling. I want to forgive them, but it's hard. I want to release the anointing of God upon your life to make it easy for you. Come quickly. Come quickly. Quiet. Please get on the stand. There is... A fountain filled with blood drawn from Emmanuel's veins and sin has plunged beneath the flood. The guilty stains. Please come, please come. Lose all their guilty stand. Hey, lose all their guilty stand. And sin that's plunged beneath the flood. Lose I'm going to repeat that call. The truth is that nobody can help you except God. I can pray for you, but nothing will happen if there's an area of your life that you need to release someone. I don't care. You know, you know some people, I mean, I have seen, I have seen people who lecturers failed because they won't sleep with them in school. I've heard of those cases who come to me. And they ended up going to another department to read a course they didn't register for 
because the lecturer said, in this university, unless I sleep with you, you won't pass. Have you heard that story before? And they went and did another course, and thankfully that is the original course God would have loved them to read. So that man pushed them from where they were, they were to where they ought to be. They may have spent one or two years, maybe longer, so what? That's the plan of God. Don't hate him or her, excuse me, be. It could be your boss. Some of you, you were sacked. You saw you thought. But God wanted to push you to your own destiny and stop being a salary earner. But you can't forgive that boss. Please come out. I want to pray for you. Please come out. Please come out. Your mother-in-law, whatever who they are. Oh, someone slept with my husband. Terrible. I won't forgive him or her or vice versa. Please come. Please come. And find rest for your souls. Doctors will also tell you that when you hold grudges, sir, it affects your health. People are coming out. Oh, the blood of Jesus. Please come, please come, whatever you may become. We're waiting for you. God wants to set you free. Please come, we're waiting for you. We need to close this service now. Deliverance, deliverance in the blood. Please come, please come. Let's pray together. I just sing that song one more time and I close my own segment of this service. Is it your husband who walked out on you? I said, you can't forgive him. Please come. Please come. There's healing. There's healing in the blood. Please come. Come. There's healing in the blood. Those of you in front, talk to the Lord about that person, about that incident that you're struggling with to forgive people over. Please talk to the Lord. You, you know exactly why you are standing before the Lord this morning. What has that person done that's so heavy in your heart that you can't seem to be able to let go? As long as you get that where we are praying is wonderful, just join us and speak to the Lord. And all you're asking for is, Lord, I ask for grace, 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 oh God, to let go for my heart. To release that man, that woman. That man that I consider to be wicked to me. Lord, I ask for grace. I did worse things to you. Say to God, you forgave me. Give me grace to forgive him or her or them as the case may be. They put Jesus on the crucifixion. He said, Lord, forgive them. Somebody stole money from you. Somebody took a loan from you. Didn't pay back. You, all you did for someone was good and good all his life. And he went back to stab you at the back. And you're nursing that injury on the inside. The balm of Gilead is here. Please come. Let him heal you. Let him heal you. Let me heal. Let him heal you. Ten more seconds and I want to pray with you. Ten more seconds. Round up with your prayers. Thank you so much. You can still come. Thank you so much. The gate of mercy is still open. In Jesus' victorious name, we pray. Father, if all I have preached in this place today is your word, ask that you will confirm it 
in the lives of everyone standing before you with signs and wonders in the name of Jesus Christ. Lord, it does not matter how hard, it does not matter how hard for, it's been for these ones. I release them from every spirit of unforgiveness in the name of Jesus. You are the balm of Gilead. Lord, apply your balm upon their hearts, upon their minds. In the name of Jesus. Devil, I stand to rebuke every influence of yours over the hearts and the minds of these ones. In the name of Jesus, I command that you cease in every of your maneuverings. In the name of Jesus. No longer shall you be able to affect their minds and their thought system. In the name of Jesus. I lose the spirit of God. The spirit of love, of true forgiveness, of healing upon you and all yours in the name of Jesus. Thank you, Father. In Jesus' victorious name, we pray. And the saints of God shout a louder amen. amen. Just before you go to your seat, this is how you can help your forgiveness process. Whoever it is, if they are still alive, as soon as you leave this service, send a text, a message, and say, I, I have forgiven you. It doesn't matter what you've done. I really forgive you. Send a text to him or her. If you can send a letter or an email, please do it. Number two, if you do have access to them, buy them a gift. Oh my God, that's becoming harder. I say, buy, buy them what? It doesn't have to be anything big. If, if it's a tie that he likes, if it's a scarf that she likes, if, if it's just whatever it is you can afford. When you do that over time, healing will come. Amen? Because you see, God is looking at the heart. Oh. God is not looking at what I say, you know. Amen? So when it's coming from this aisle at the next service, don't go through that place. Hello, bro. Hello, sis. God bless you. Amen? I know it's hard, but it's not undoable. I've had to do that. I love people who have done the wrongest thing to me in life. And guess what? God is always causing me to triumph. When you decide not to do that, you know what you're doing? You're fighting your course on your own. Guess what God will do? He will fold his arms. But Exodus 14, 14 says, you will not need to fight. You will fold your arms and the Lord will fight for you. Two of you cannot be fighting your enemies. It has to be either you or God. You have fought all this while you can't win. So forgive him, love him, and let God do what he can do. God bless us. Go back to your seat. I just have one call before I sit down. Let's make that very quickly. Has God been good to us today? Does he deserve our praise? Can we stand up and give it to him? A clap offering a standing ovation to Jesus. A standing ovation to Jesus. Standing ovation to Jesus. All heads bowed and all eyes closed. I just have two minutes. All heads bowed and all eyes closed. Please, no one looking anywhere except our ministry. Close your eyes, bow down your head. I'm here this morning, but I do not know Jesus. I come to church. I'm a regular church goer. Maybe this church, maybe some other churches. But I have never answered an all to call. I've never given my life to Christ. But I want to do that this morning. Pastor, please pray with me. If you need God to help you, you must first have a relationship with him. Of father and daughter, father and son. I want to invite you this morning, if you want to give your life to Jesus, can I ask you to signify by raising up your, your right hand? I want to give you a card and I will put it down quickly. And then we pray together. Keep the hands up. Ushers, do this very quickly. I want to give my life to Jesus. Whatever you may be, please. I have a gift for the first four people that come out from the church. Thank you, Pastor. That's quite thoughtful of you. It's a wonderful gift, the first four of you. Can I invite you to come to the altar? The first four. Those are three gifts. And I wait for the. I want to give my life to Jesus. Pastor, please pray with me. Come quickly. Come quickly. Come quickly. Whatever you may be upstairs in the gallery. God bless you, sir.
You have the fourth one. God bless you, sir. God bless you, sir. I'm still waiting for you. Please don't let us waste time. Soon and very soon We are going to see the Soon and very soon We are going to see the Soon and very soon Please come We are going to see the Lord Hallelujah 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 Please come, please come. No more dying there. No more dying there. Please come, please come. No more dying there. I want us to pray for them that God will establish them in faith. They will not fail, they will not fall. As they have given their life to Jesus today, God will do something special in their life. Shall we pray for them? Thank you, Jesus. Shall we begin to bring our prayer to a close now? So shall it be in the name of the Father. I know the Son, I know the Holy Spirit. God bless you, church. God bless you, my sister. You can see our sister there within the. Hallelujah. Please, if you have been blessed today, come on with you unto God Almighty. Hallelujah. I want us to turn to our daddy and say, Daddy, you are blessed. God bless you. Then we strength forth our hands to him. This is an expository message. I want us to pray with him and his family. Say, Lord, 